Um, could I just begin before while people are gathering their, their thoughts with a with a question? You mentioned uh, that you thought that the Doha round was eighty percent there, that there was a strong imperative on on the part of the developing countries to secure an agreement, and that with a little bit of extra effort, uh, it could be uh, it could be reached. Uh, could you tell us who you think needs to make that little bit of extra effort? <laughs> That's a dangerous uh, answer, uh, but look, uh, it's when you look at why we didn't get there last year, that's where the answer to your question is. We didn't get there last year mostly because on the agricultural side, India uh, was uh, insisting uh, on uh, the parameters of a safeguard clause for addressing surges uh, of ag imports uh, in developing countries, that others were finding uh, to lose. There's no problem. There will be a safeguard clause for addressing import surges for developing countries. The question is whether it's a taxi or whether it's an ambulance. Mm. No. Mm. And depending uh, on uh, the parameters, uh, it can be either a taxi or an ambulance. Uh, and it's not exactly the same thing, and you don't use it the same way. On the other side, uh, we also had a problem with the US, uh, who were pushing uh, for uh, extra concessions by developing countries on top of what the tariff cuts in manufacturers would happen as a consequence of this formula, which erases tariffs, including peak tariffs, uh, the US were uh, pushing more than what emerging countries uh, were ready to accept. So this is the two issues where, at the end of the day, we could not cross this, uh, this line which would have sort of led us six or seven months later to the conclusion of the round. Now, in themselves, if you look at these two issues, not hugely important in terms of numbers, uh, trade flows, in terms of the consequences, whichever scenario you take. But the truth is that it has a big political reverberation within the Indian political system, and you know the Indian political system is a hugely uh, sort of uh, very, very lively place, uh, extremely vibrant, and, uh, and you've got regular elections, and same in the US, uh, because of this notion in US public opinion that after all, uh, trade has benefited uh, others more than the US as if that was true, but you know, it's something which in US politics uh, makes a, a, bit of a, a bit of a resonance. So this is where we need, uh, in both cases, uh, a bit of relooking at that. Uh, we have a new US administration. It obviously uh, takes a bit of time uh, before uh, they uh, are uh, up and running uh, on trade. Uh, we have uh, Indian. Uh, we have elections in India sometime uh, end of April, beginning of May. Uh, that's probably the reason why short term. I mean, short term being for me weeks. Uh, there's little chance that political negotiators, ministers, uh, will be uh, back in Geneva to try and clinch this. In the meantime, we are doing a lot of technical work across the board in this sort of. 20 topics, uh, 20 remits of the negotiation. Uh, but these two issues and these two protagonists uh, will have to go back to the negotiating table as soon as possible. Again, probably not in the coming uh, weeks. Thank you. Yes, question up the back here. Simon Marks Isaac. You talked about the surge of enthusiasm for protectionism. Clearly there are some countries that have come out and made either internally or globally their position very clear as supporters of 
increased protection. Which, though, are the countries that, notwithstanding what's going on around the world at the moment, are still firmly in favour, both domestically and globally, of um, breaking down trade and building trade? Well, I mean, as I said briefly uh, in my remarks, this protectionist uh, uh, pressure is there. And it's perfectly understandable uh, in terms of economic and social hardship. Uh, you know, people run for protection. They want to protect their job. They want to protect their pension. Uh, they see what's happening in financial markets. So there is a huge sort of demand for protection. And we know by experience uh, that, you know, protectionism, I mean, there's a sort of good ring down there. Huh? Protectionism, which is a, a sort of economic, uh, really people, you know, shooting in their own foot, doesn't deserve anything like, you know, Adjective like, you know, I sometimes hear about smart protectionism, you know, what we call in French oxymore. Huh? It's a total contradiction. It simply doesn't work, but it is attractive. Now, part of that can be coped with with uh, the disciplines of WTO. Big protectionism, huge protectionism, intensive protectionism, the sort of the ones we had in the 1930s, very, very little probability. Why? Because there are disciplines which WTO members have subscribed and which contain their margin of maneuver. Now, there remains a margin of maneuver, which is where we are sort of, which were well, the one we are putting under the street lamp, uh, because in many areas there remains a capacity, as I said, for people to move up their applied rates as long as they don't bump into their bound rates, or to move up their subsidies as long as they don't bump into their maximum, or to install or increase export subsidies as long as they have entitlement stemming from what they got in the euro. Now, is much of that happening? No. Not much. For the moment, it's been reasonably well contained for the moment and as far as I can detect on my radar picture and I, I give it to WTO members and it's not something which is secret we regularly now will provide them with uh, all the elements that appear uh, on the radar screen now for the moment again Yes, there's been a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of, uh, you know, we had at, at a certain, during two weeks, we had a bit of a bumpy debate on this by American clause, for instance, of the U.S. stimulus package. At the end of the day, the U.S. president and the administration uh, stopped short of crossing the line of the obligation they had subscribed in WTO, which, by the way, is one good example of how these disciplines bite. Now, who has been uh, extremely good, which is always easier uh, than the other way around? Japan is okay. Korea is okay. This country is okay. New Zealand is okay. I think the, the, real, the real hero of this period uh, is probably Brazil, huh? because one day there was a notification in the official journal of Brazil that the next day a whole system of import licensing system uh, was uh, to be put together, uh, and that was a decision by one of the ministers. Huh? The next day there was a proclamation in the uh, legal uh, Brazilian press that what had been uh, decreed the day before was totally nullified by a special decree of the president. So that, that worked well. Uh, in this case, you've got the sort of fact, you've got the evidence. So if there was to be a price, I should, maybe I shouldn't go public on this too much. <laughs> uh, but you know, if there was to be a price for this period, 
I think uh, President uh, Lula uh, would get uh, number one. Maybe we could give uh, sort of number two or number three to uh, President Obama for what he did uh, in uh, by America. Although, although as we all know, the devil is in the detail of the implementation, huh? because the legislation says that it will be implemented in a way which is compatible uh, with the U.S. international obligations, including WTO. So let's be cautious. Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry. Yes. Okay. Peter Walsh, Australian Services Roundtable. Um, has there been any further thought given to separating out services negotiations from the uh, agriculture and NAMA negotiations? Because uh, it's one of the uh, things that seem to have, uh, uh, this all in, all out problem seems to be one of the major stumbling blocks in Doha. I mean. Well, first, the situation has changed since last year in services. Uh, we've had in July a successful session where members have tabled uh, new offers, new ideas, new sectors, uh, new commitments uh, that has sort of put quite a bit of energy on this. Now, could services be extracted from uh, what we call the singular undertaking, which is this uh, bundling of the 20 topics which have been put uh, together in the bag of the negotiation with the understanding that the negotiation will only conclude when uh, everything is agreed? I don't think so. I think uh, this bag of negotiation uh, was negotiated, uh, in fact, during three years. It's a carefully balanced a package of a mix of uh, offensives and defensives. Now, of course, all trade negotiators would love their own hobby horse to be extracted and agreed in itself. I'm sure Australia would love uh, agricultural subsidies uh, in US, uh, EU, or Japan uh, tackled as such. I'm sure many least developing countries would love uh, duty-free, quota-free uh, to be tackled as such. I'm, I'm convinced, and not just intellectually, because that's what they tell me every day, that the African cotton producers would love the issue of US and EU cotton subsidies uh, to be solved tomorrow. It simply doesn't work this way. Uh, and why doesn't it work this way? Because at the end of the day, the U.S. Uh, administration needs to convince Congress uh, that uh, reducing a sort of uh, two to three billion dollars a year of uh, subsidies to U.S. cotton producers to something which is less unreasonable, and I don't want to give a number, won't happen if it's not mixed with something else which other constituencies in Congress than uh, the constituency that will resist the reduction of this uh, big uh, check. And same, same in, uh, in EU. Now, I, under, I, I know that in Australia, sp specifically, and New Zealand to some extent, uh, this is sometimes difficult to understand because you mostly have offensive interests everywhere. The, 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 peculiarity of the Australian negotiating position. Let's leave aside uh, uh, state trading enterprises a, a minute as not a sort of major big component of the negotiation, although it will remain a component of the negotiation. In agriculture, you have offensive interests. In services, you have offensive interests. In manufacturers, you have offensive interests. In anti-dumping, you have offensive interests. In, in Fishery subsidies, you have offensive interests. So it's, it's offensive all over the place. So in a way, there is a, there is a sort of bias of perception here. You should understand that in other places of this planet, starting with uh, Tokyo, uh, for sure Brussels, uh, undoubtedly Washington, uh, probably even also now uh, Beijing or Delhi, uh, there needs to be 
a balance and for this balance to be there, offensives and defensives need to be bundled together. Fiona Wayne, Environment Thanks. Business Australia. Um, Pascal, you mentioned that trade has a good governance framework. Um, you also mentioned that finance sector doesn't appear to have such a good governance framework. Um, we sadly seem to see not only a lack of governance framework, but uh, a loss of any sense of value at the fundamental level in the finance and the economic system. Can trade in this crucial period carry the market with a governance framework that it has, um, and not only for the financial side, but also I'm thinking in terms of ecosystem support services and, and what's coming down the line on climate change. Well, I mean, trade cannot, the governance of international trade cannot substitute the sort of political drive and the sort of governance machinery that you need in environment or in finance. We have this for trade. It happens that for historical reasons, uh, and notably because of what happened during the Great Depression, uh, the notion that binding rules and a governance system was needed has appeared earlier than in other areas. And I've tried very simply to look at the principles, uh, fairness, level playing field, uh, transparency, uh, sort of due process for reviewing and for uh, settling disputes, which could inspire in other areas. But the reality is that you have this in environment, uh, there, is, there is political energy to tackle environment worldwide. You don't have a world environment agreement, true. You don't have a world environment organization, true. But you have a network, some would say a myriad, of conventions, multilateral environment agreements, each with its own secretariat. UNEP uh, is trying to sort of handle all this coherently. So there is something there. And if you take climate change, the political architecture of who has to do what in terms of reduction of CO2 emissions will have to happen within this framework. It won't happen in WTO if it doesn't happen there. It can. What we can do in WTO is adjust, draw, import in the rules of international trade the consequences of a solid political agreement. Finance is a totally different area. I mean, finance is a black hole of, of international governance. You know, the, the international uh, organization which is, uh, uh, which is regulating uh, animal disease is much more seriously structured than anything in international finance. Now, that's a reality. Now, why? A, because transmission of animal diseases has done a lot of harm in human experiences. Uh, and second, uh, because when the discussion was whether sovereign nation states should accept to er erode their sovereignty in order to cope with this problem, the basic answer was yes. Now, in finance, we know by experience that these bubbles happen. So it's not, it's not the lack of experience. It's the fact that when the issue was stable several times, the answer was no. Maybe there's a problem, but we are not ready to pay the price of eroding the sovereign rights we have as nation states not to regulate this. If that's a political reality. The debate took place several times for the last 20 years. Now, if this doesn't happen, trade rules will not substitute for that. Again, we can adjust. We have a general agreement on trading services. 
we have a financial services agreement. There are very detailed rules down there that might need to be adjusted in case there would be a strong regulation of international finance, as in case there would be a CO2 emission scheme agreed internationally. We can import this in WTO, no problem. We've done it in many, many areas. We recognize more and more, and this is part of the quote-unquote jurisprudence of the dispute settlement system, the standards which are created by other international organizations. We a priori accept that. So it's the issue of coherence is not really there. But what we cannot do in this sort of Westphalian system of international governance where nation states belong to agreements or organizations on their own is substitute something that's not happening in a specific field. And if, if you want another example of where, in my view, you probably will need in the future more of this uh, sort of coordination through binding obligations is the area of migrations, and which obviously is a huge global problem and which, if you look at the capacity of the planet to regulate it, not in detail, but the sort of principles within which sovereign nation state then operate, it's also probably an area uh, where the layer is, in my view, uh, much too thin. Karen Snowden from ABC Radio Australia. If I could take you back to your previous answer about uh, the separation of particular s sectors, and that that might not be possible. If I understood correctly, you've repeated um, the WTO stance, long-standing position, that it's an all-or-nothing deal as far as Doha goes. But do you ever see a point where it will have to be abandoned? Do you ever see that happening, this all or nothing approach, not delivering the complete Doha round and that, say, services won't be followed up as a result? No, I don't, I don't see that happening at all. <laughs> for, for a simple reason is that it's been bundled. There was a lengthy, complex negotiation on whether or not, for instance, disciplining fishery subsidies would be part of the negotiation. And at the time, I remember full well, although I should not remember because I was in a different position, I remember full well those who were in favor of putting this in the bag and those who were in the favor of putting this in the bag. And mind you, it resembles very much the geography of today's positions of those who want strong regulation of fishery subsidies and those who are not keen and you know would like something which is sort of reasonably lax. Now, given that many of these topics, notably in uh, agriculture, uh, which is why agriculture has taken such a prominence uh, uh, in this negotiation, I mean, of course, it's due to the fact that Australia changed the Cairns Group and the Cairns Group is a major. Run. Okay, true. Uh, the reality is that agriculture has taken the prominence it's taken because we have three quarters of members in WTO who now are actively participating in developing countries and it's a major issue for them. No way, no way around could be concluded without a severe slashing down of trade distorting subsidies, without the elimination of export subsidies and so on. And that's already on the table. But mind you, the US and the EU and Japan, who have to swallow this, will not swallow this without what they need to get, for instance, in uh, industrial tariffs. So in terms of the list of 20 topics, it won't change. There will have to be an agreement on each of these 20 topics. What remains to be finalized is how much marginally in each of these topics, given where we are in the negotiation. Will we have strong or weak exceptions for uh, 
which sort of developing countries in artisanal fishing as opposed to high sea fishing. Huh? Now, there's a bit, of, there remains a bit of margin of maneuver on things like industrial tariffs, for instance. Anti-dumping, there remains a bit to be negotiated. So, there remains margin of flexibilities within each of these 20 topics, but to answer clearly your question, I cannot see one of these 20 topics uh, falling off the table without a member or a group of members uh, resisting this, uh, which then takes us back to the single undertaking now. Whether for the future, the technology of the single undertaking uh, remains uh, the right one is for sure something we will have to discuss. But for the moment, that's where we are. Uh, Direct Director General Peter Yule is my name from the Australian Trade Commission. I'm sure the OIE will be very pleased about your ringing endorsement uh, today. You mentioned earlier the issue of coordination and collaboration internationally to address this international crisis. Uh, what evidence are you seeing that that uh, consensus for coordinated action is developing and uh, what can we expect from, from April in London? Well, two, two bits of, of answer on this. And I think that the starting point is obvious. Uh, we need uh, more coherence, uh, more coordination, uh, more cooperation among the various bits of the archipelago of uh, international governance. Now, first observation, uh, and this is contrary to conventional wisdom as I uh, see it in uh, many places on this planet, this is not mostly a problem for organizations. It's a problem for members of the organizations. All these organizations are member-driven. They've been created by sovereign Westphalian nation states. And if you take the example of uh, trade and labor, for instance, uh, which I will uh, rediscuss uh, here with uh, Australian uh, trade unions, who've always been quite pushing on this, ILO members who happen to be the same as WTO members have subscribed obligations on core labor standards in ILO. And then the question arises by some that, you know, why doesn't WTO ensure the implementation of ILO core labor standards through trade sanctions? Well, the Westphalian answer to this is you don't need this. ILO members are bound by the obligations they've taken in ILO. As WTO members are bound by the obligations they've taken in WTO, fine, no problem. Now, the reality, as we all know, is that our members do not always behave coherently to put it uh, diplomatically, some uh, because they've decided not to be coherent, and by the way, they see this incoherence as a way of ensuring their sovereignty, not being constrained by a coherence which others would see as a coherence, but which they don't see as a coherence, and then, of course, many members because their system of governance is, uh, is very weak. So, first and foremost, and it's a difficult thing to implement because public opinion doesn't really put the coherence of the government in the various remits of its international activity as a priority of domestic political debate. Maybe except in highly uh, moral and uh, reformed societies like uh, Nordic countries in Europe, you know, Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland are places where politics might have a grip on this, but frankly speaking, not that much else. Uh, second, uh, 
whichever, I mean, take the examples of Bretton Woods institutions, huh? World Bank, WTO, IMF. We work fine. Huh? We are friends, that happens to be the case. We speak on the phone anytime necessary, we exchange emails, uh, we do briefs together for Gordon Brown, for uh, Angela Merkel, for uh, the uh, Italian presidency of the G8 if necessary. Where we have a limit is going public on the use we do of the limited executive authority we have. And I'm, I'm, I'm more than others in the, in the business of regulation, so uh, I have a big legislator, uh, and my own executive authority is relatively more limited. So, what, where, where part of the difficulty is, is in the determination of what leaders of international organizations can do, how much do they need to go to their board, when they have a board, I have no board. I have a floor of 153 members, uh, which is uh, sort of my uh, testing body. Uh, it has advantages and inconvenience not to have a board, and we often discuss that with, with the others. Uh, but this, this, is where, this is where the difficulty lies. But at the end of the day, you cannot promote coherence against your members. That's the fundamental lesson. And, you know, the only place where they've breached this uh, technological uh, barrier, of course, is, is within the European Union, where they have a system for creating coherence, which is 50 times more powerful than what we have in our Westphalian system, and even 50 times sometimes doesn't work, as we can see on a few examples. Thanks. Look, I'm afraid with Peter's question, we've come to the end of, uh, of our time to ask everyone here to join me in thanking. Thanks a lot. Thank you.